Hello and welcome to AFC Bournemouth's first ever Google Plus Hangout. We are live here at the Gold Sand Stadium. I'm joined by Captain Tommy Elphick and four very lucky supporters, who you can see along the bottom there. Uh, they're going to be putting their questions to Tommy through the next half an hour. We have also been asking for questions on social media for the past week, so I will get a chance to answer some of those. And please, if you have a question for Tommy, tweet us at AFC Bournemouth. And I've got my iPad. Tommy is ready. He knows he's going to get all the questions from all different angles. Uh, firstly, Tommy, thank you very much for joining us. No problem. Um, just a little catch up so far. It's not been a bad start to the season, has it? No, it's, it's, a, it's a very good start. Um, obviously, we're a little bit disappointed not to take three points against Nottingham Forest, even a point after being 1 1. But I think there's plenty of, of positives to come out of the, um, the performance and ready to go again on Saturday. I was going to say, I know you were off yesterday, but you're back in today, first training session since Tuesday. I saw how disappointed you were, mm. but last in good spirits today. Yeah, I think we have to be. Um, as you say, it's, it's a positive start and we can't lose sight of that. Um, we went to two very tough away games and, and looking to take maximum points to end the first section of games before the first international break on another high. Said exactly like a pro. Tommy was taking the mickey a little bit before, saying how nervous I was, but I think Tommy's very well green, very good at this, and knows exactly what to say. Um, I'm firstly going to take some of the supporters' questions that you've been sending in this week. There's a few people that really wanted to join us but couldn't due to location, internet speed, etc. And I had a few people that were really gutted, so I'll go. Tommy, we're going to go straight in. Um, someone, Neil Harling, would like to know it's only three games gone, but can we reach the playoffs? Um. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't see why not. Obviously, we, we, we've got to be looking to, to aim as, as high as possible this season. Um, we've given ourselves a, a great platform to to really kick on now. And, and obviously, with the performance we put on, put on Tuesday, um, there were so many positives to take out of it. You know, we can't get downhearted about it. And as I say, it's a, such a long season. All we've done is, is made a good start. Um, I know it's early days to be starting to talk about stuff like this, but we are in the top six and we want to stay there for as long as possible. A good answer that I think all the supporters will like there. Um, ben Lewis would like to know, who was your first goal against? Who for? And what was it like? Uh, first professional goal was it was against Huddersfield, actually. Um, it was a header. Uh, it took a, a while coming. I think it was about 25, 30 games in. It was a Tuesday <laughs> night. Not many fans there. It was horrible weather, but it was pleasing one and I think I went on to get about four that season so yeah it was a, it was a good start and ended the season on fire. And one more that I want to get in quickly, Charlie Dancer would like to know do you play FIFA or Football Manager in your spare time? No I don't know, there, there's a lot of um, keen FIFA fans and uh, Football Manager fans in the dressing room, um, I used to be mad on both but I uh, don't know time seems to have taken its toll on me and not quite interested in it anymore. Too much football here Monday to Friday and, and including the Saturday. So. Oh, Tommy. Yeah, I'm <laughs> in a couple of weeks. Okay, um, I'll come back to those. Please keep tweeting us them at AFC Bournemouth. Um, I've got my iPad, like I said, and Tommy is ready. Okay, let's cut straight to it. And I've got four very excited supporters waiting to speak to Tommy. Um, firstly, we've got Peter Lunn, who is in his Bournemouth shirt, and he is ready. Peter, fire away. Hi there. Hi. Um, yeah. It's really good to be here. I'm a Bournemouth based pretty, pretty much for most of my life. First game I came to was when I was about eight. Uh, we went nil nil. Uh, came back though, and that was in the days when sort of kids for a quid was 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 expensive. So you can guess how long ago that was. Um, but my first question, Tommy, for you was, uh, you know, when you were growing up as a kid, um, what were the players that inspired you, and uh, have you had, ever had the chance to play against any of them? Um. Yeah, no, nice to talk to you, Peter. Um, first player I really sort of took a shine to was, was Tony Adams. Um, he was a great leader, great captain, and uh, I don't know, I just always loved the way he played. Uh, he was quite old school, but still he, he managed to play for a long time. Um, he was quite cultured towards the end, you know, playing for Arsenal in, in the very good teams. But I say immediately, like the, the player I look up to now and who sort of coming through my youth team days that, that I really took a shine to was, was John Terry. Um, absolutely love him, everything about him, his, his passion, um, the way he plays the game. Uh, I think he's possibly one of the most underrated center arts in the world. Um, even now, I think certainly in, in my generation, he must be the, the best English center half that, that we've seen. So them two, really. Great. Uh, you've not got no plans following on um, 
John, uh, not John Taylor, the other guy, um, the Arsenal guy, I forgot his name. Tony Adams. <laughs> Tony Adams, not, no plans to follow you into management then later in your career? Well, no, listen, I, that's, that's obviously a long way away, but um, I, I've been lucky enough to, to work with some great managers, um, obviously the gaffer here and um, sort of in my, my earlier days, Dean Wilkins and um, Gus Poyer at Brighton, you know, just sort of free to, to mention. Um, so, I like, I listen, I, I'd love to do it just to see what the other side's like, the amount of work that they put in, and it's, it's crazy, really. Like, you, you come in now at this time and the gaffer's still here, you know, doing his work, and it is, it's, it, that really is 24-7. So, I, I would love to experience that one day, but, but that is a long way off. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think there's a lot of us, all of us would say, you, you, you know, Eddie Howe and Jason Tim are pretty good mentors for, for later in your career, probably. Yeah, um, I think it's just remarkable, really, what they're doing every day. Um, mm. Lucky enough to be to be working with them, you know. Um, you'd certainly want to be working with them rather than against them because they're just looking to improve the club every day and they come in every day and, and you just see new things that they're bringing to the club. Um, just little things like every single session we do it, it's thought out and it's, it's so well planned and they, they leave no st stone unturned when it comes to a match day. So it's, it's, it's remarkable to be working underneath them, really. Great. Thanks, Tommy. Thanks, Kelly. Fantastic. Thank you, Peter. Some good questions there. Um, we're going to go straight to George, who is waiting next. George is in Brighton, I think. So a bit of a connection yeah. there for Tommy. George, do you want to just introduce yourself and fire away with your first question? Yep. Hi, Tommy. Uh, my name's George. Uh, I'm in Hove, not Brighton. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Hove, actually. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I've been a Bournemouth fan for about 10 years. Uh, yeah, still go quite often now. Um, first off, uh, first question, Tommy. Um, how what was your relationship with Steve Cook like before you you both joined Bournemouth? Obviously, back in the Brighton days. Um, yeah, no, it's, uh, Cookie was a bit younger than me, um, and I remember sort of uh, I was in the team, and, and Cookie was next in line, if you like. Um, he made his debut against Man City in, in the Carling Cup. I remember he, he had a long throw and the manager put him on because he was losing to use the long throw. Mm -hmm. um, but I took, I took a shine to Cookie quite early because he was he was like really hard working and you know, I just wanted to try and help him out as much as I can if it was advice or, or whatever it may be. But um, the time he really caught my eye was actually when he made his move to Bournemouth. Um, I was out injured and... Uh, Cookie was sort of on the bench, uh, wasn't really playing, and Bournemouth come in from on loan. It was it was quite a big move. I think he was still only about 18 or 19, and he was in and around the first team. But to actually go on loan to to a, a League One club and and really really wanted to play, it, I, I sort of took a shine to him and, and thought that I would always keep an eye on him and, and look out for him and, and whatever it may be. And he, he actually come back to Brighton after doing really well in his in his first spell on loan. Played one game. Um, and then, like, understandably, Bournemouth wanted him back. Yeah. Um, but Brighton also wanted to keep him because they were short of centre half at the time, um, and he had done really well. But Cookie, to his credit, he, he wanted to move on, and he obviously enjoyed his time here um, and, and wanted to play regularly. And I had massive respect for that because it would have been easy for, for Cookie to stay and sign a new contract at Brighton and not play. And you know, Brighton at the time with the new stadium, it was a it was a big draw. Um, so I remember gaining a lot of respect for Cookie then and. You know, when he broke through at that early age, he, he never quite went on to make as many appearances as he had liked to have done. Um, so to do what he's done now, he's, he's just every day, he's, he's getting better and better. So I'm um, just really happy to, to be playing with him at the moment. Good. Uh, also just wondering, who's who's the best attacker that you've ever come up against? In time? Um, obviously, like last season, playing against Suarez and, and Starry yeah. was unbelievable. I mean, that's pretty obvious. And, and obviously, Ronaldo, Benzema. Yeah. Um, it was great, you know. Uh, I think you learn so much about yourself and and about how the game is played at the highest level when, when you get chance to, to play against them. You know, it's an amazing experience. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously in our league, there, there's so many good strikers. You know, we were talking about it the other day. It was a somber longer on, on yeah. Tuesday and, you know, the weekend before that, it's, it's well, uh, Narky Wells and, you know, Brentford have, have paid a lot of money for some strikers, Andre Gray. And, you know, even coming up, Jordan Rhodes and, and Gusted this week, um, Lewis Graben the week after with Lafferty <laughs> and, yeah. and now Kenwin Jones. So it would be it would be unfair to really pick one out in the championship because there is so many. And yeah. They pay such big money from nowadays as well. They come with a lot of pressure. So 
fair play to him to, for, for keep performing. But obviously, to answer your question, it's got to be Suarez and, yeah. and Ronaldo. Lovely. Thanks very much, then, Tommy. Cheers. Mm. Cheers. Just going to pick up there. You mentioned grabs, Tommy. I want to talk to you a little bit about that because yeah, I know it was a big miss, but mm. we've, um, in terms of our strikers and our squad, we haven't got a bad bunch there, have we? No, and um, I think Callum's, again, he's got so much potential. Um, mm. Stepped up from League One and taken it in his stride, really, obviously. He was, we was all buzzing for him, and he was obviously buzzing by getting two goals in his, in his first game, and that can help a striker so much. Um, you come with a big price tag, a lot of pressure replacing someone like Grabs, and you know he's he's settled in now, and and, and he's got that out of the way, and can really kick on. Um, Jan's obviously got off the mark. He'd be a little bit disappointed that Callum nicked the goal off him on Tuesday, but um, and then obviously listen, don't write off Brett as well. Brett is such a good player, and he hasn't started the season, um, but you know he's going to be a big player for us, and, and obviously TK. Um, between the four of them, there's so much potential and ability that, that you know they're only going to keep getting better as well so there's there's high hopes for our strikers this season looking forward to coming up against grabs not long now i am yeah listen there's no excuses against grabs because we've obviously trained against him so much and we know our games inside out he knows us we know him so it's, it's going to be interesting um grabs was a great player he was a great lad for the dressing room but that's gone now um and, and as i say we've got four good strikers to look forward to this season Brilliant. Right, next up, Gareth, I know you're sitting there waiting with your Bournemouth shirt behind you, which I know Tommy's very impressed with. Um, did you want to fire away with your first question? Yeah, uh, hi, uh, I'm Gareth. I've been supporting Bournemouth for about 25, 26 years now. Um, and for those of you who don't know, I write the Shirt Tales uh, piece in the Match Day program. Um, so, yeah, I'd like to ask Tommy, how did your move to Bournemouth uh, come about? Um, Obviously, you spent a long time out injured at Brighton. They moved to a new stadium, um, you make your comeback, and then you moved to Bournemouth. How did that come about? Yeah, um, obviously, I'd, I'd come through Brighton at a young age, signed a, quite a long contract, and I always saw myself uh, playing for Brighton. I couldn't see anything else. We were moving into a wonderful new stadium. Um, things were going good. We had, we'd just been promoted from League One, and on the last day of the season away at Notts County, I, I ended up rupturing, rupturing my Achilles. Um, cut a long story short, I was out for 18 months, but I'm, I'm a firm believer in things happen for a reason, you know. Um, and that was my focus, to get back fit. And The team had done really well while I was out injured. Um, understandably, I'd, I'd fell down the pecking order. I was sort of probably fourth in line, if I'm, if I'm being honest. Uh, coming off the back of the injury, I, I made my comeback. Um, and then it was time for me to, to re-establish myself um, and sat down with Poye and you know me and him we had a fantastic relationship um, and he, he felt it was best if I went out on loan for like three months minimum uh, possibly Christmas and, and come back to Brighton fully fit and, and try and break back into the team that way so uh, I had a few offers a um, few people interested and Again, understandably, off the back of an injury like that, um, people wasn't quite sure, you know. Um, and Bournemouth was one of the first clubs that had, had cropped up. Um, obviously, I, going back to the Cookie situation, I'd been keeping an eye on Bournemouth because of Cookie was there and it was hearing so much about the way that they're coming forward, uh, new owners, um, plans for the stadium, and, you know, they was making probably the biggest push at the time to, to get to League One so that was my first sort of option to, to come and see the facilities uh, meet the manager who was obviously Paul Groves at the time uh, so I come down with my agent and, and my dad um, we sat down with, with Paul Groves and I liked what he had to say you know his visions for the club the way he wanted to train um, and most importantly the, the visions that he had for me um, and, and how he was going to sort of help me get back to full fitness and uh, I had a look at the training ground and everything suited me, you know, it wasn't too far from home, a uh, lovely place to live and, and a club going forward and it, it was similar to the project that, that was going on at Brighton um, in terms of trying to make that push to the championship, it was progressive and there's not many clubs in England that are progressive at, at the moment, you know, with the financial strengths and, and things like that, so everything fit the bill um, and after meeting the manager he, he expressed that he wanted it actually to be more of a, a permanent thing, uh, it was quite scary if I'm honest at the time. I'd never been away from Brighton. Um, I was part of the furniture there, you know. I was always expected to be the captain to lead the team out at the new stadium, and 
because things hadn't quite gone like that, injuries had held me back. Um, I was posed with this situation, and I just felt at the time it was probably right for me to move on. It was time for me to to reestablish myself and get back to full fitness and, and get my teeth stuck in elsewhere. And I often say it was a it was a, probably the best thing I've done up to now. So. I was trying to cut a long story short, but didn't really. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's okay, cool. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so you didn't, you didn't ever see it as a as a sort of a step backwards in your career, even though to start off with it didn't go very well on the pitch. Not just for not for you personally, but for the team. Mm -hmm. Struggle, change the manager. Um, did you did you ever look at it and think, God, oh, I've made the wrong decision here? <laughs> Yeah, I think for the first 12 games of that season, yeah. Um, no, listen, uh, to be fair to, to Paul and, and Sean, they, they were great guys. They, they were good football people and, and they've got to take credit for, for some of the players that they've brought in, you know, because a lot of them are, are still here. Um, and obviously, yeah, I did I did at times think have I made the right decision, you know, it would have, he was losing, it, it wasn't a very happy place. Um, and you do have them niggling doubts in, in the back of your mind, but... You sort of have to revert back to to what you believed when you was on your way down, and just every day I was seeing too much in training from from the lads, and uh, we was producing some stuff in training, and for whatever reason we wasn't quite getting that out to the pitch. But always remain confident that if we could just get that first win, um, that, that we would always go on a good run and, and finish at the right end of the table. I didn't quite believe that we could still get promoted after 12 games in. Um, probably after about three or four of the gaffer beat and then, then I didn't have a doubt in my mind that we would get promoted. Um, and, and that feeling when the gaffer come back, you know, it was crazy. It was it was unbelievable. Just turned the whole place around. Um, we got a massive lift off the fans. Um, we'd won that first game, I think it was late in Orient. Um, and we sort of never looked back. Um, a lot of the team spirit stems from from that day when the gaffer comes back and what he's done is is nothing short of a miracle really. Right there, Gareth. That was a yeah. lovely. Tommy's never short of a few words. It's not. Cut a long story short. <laughs> he doesn't do that. He says he does, but he doesn't. Um, I'm just going to. That's going to lead quite nicely on to. We're getting supporters' questions through on Twitter, so thank you everyone for sending them in. Ben Allcroft has asked, "What was your favourite moment of last season?" So that's actually not the promotion season, but last. Last season. season. Um, you can pick one out of the promotion season, but it's probably pretty obvious. Promotion season was obviously getting promoted, but I think the feeling that the gaffer brought the day he come back was was brilliant. You know, the, the first day of training that we actually did under him, I'll never forget that day. You know, he brought the lads together, and it was brilliant, fantastic for us going forward. Um, last season, I think Reading away was was a special day, and um, then obviously was it the three, two or three games at home that we had Leeds, Forest, Reading, well, yeah, Reading, Leeds, and Forest. That that moment of last season was, was brilliant. March wasn't a bad month last year, was it really? No, it wasn't. No, it, was, it was good. Okay, brilliant. Adrian, sorry you've been waiting patiently there. Um, you are still there. Yeah, you are. Um, do you want to just introduce yourself to Tommy and fire away with your question? Hi, Tommy. I'm Adrian. Um, I've been supporting side for as long as I remember. Um, my question to you is, who's the current joker of the dressing room and what is the best prank during your time at the Best. Was that the best so, prank at the time? Prank, oh, yeah. Sorry, Adrian, you cut out, but the best prank at the time of car. And I want Thomas to be careful what he says yeah. here because footballers. Um, the the joker is is Harry Arter. He's always up to something. Uh, <laughs> Cutting the laces. Whether it's funny. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, him and Matt Ritchie are on at each other at the moment. It's, it is funny. I mean, with Matty's hairstyle, that's, that's a joke in itself, isn't it? Let's be honest. I'm, I'm not going to comment. Cause I'll get um, yeah, so that's probably the best prank I've seen is Matty's hairdresser giving him that haircut. Um, <laughs> but no, there, there, there's um, Frano, Cookie, H. They're always up to something, but it's such a good dress room, you know. We, we, we sort of, we have a laugh every day and outside of when the gaffer's doing these sessions, obviously, you know, it's great camaraderie and uh, Schwan Jalau used to be on the, the back of a few pranks last season, but best prank I'd probably have to say, I think Smithy, Adam Smith tried to, uh, he done something silly knocking um, Matt Ritchie's boots out of his hand the other day and he took it the wrong way and just Matt Ritchie just took it to another level and emptied his toilet bag out in the in the ice bath, so needless to say it cost Smithy a few quid in toiletries, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a good place to be every day. There's, there's, there's plenty of things going on. 
Thank you. Awesome. The pranks, yeah, I'll have to stay away from them. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't a bad one. That wasn't a bad one. Um, was that was that you done? Sorry, I can't see. I can't see Adrian very well. Oh, brilliant. I'm still here. Um, no, I'm still there. <laughs> Sorry, I thought we lost you then. If you could partner any centre back in world football, who would it be and why? Um, well, it'd have to be John Terry. Um, just the way he plays, I love it. Um, I'd just like to experience his, his sort of leadership and, and try and learn off him a little bit. Um, great centre half. Uh, just off the top of my head as well, Maldini. I used to love watching Maldini. Um, probably didn't see him in his heyday, but. Um, he, was, he was another one who I used to look up to a lot, um, and Cannavaro, was it the 2002 World Cup, uh, he, or 2006, I forget when, when did it, 2002, wasn't it? This is going to make me look stupid. We're, 2006, we're going to 2006 yeah. over there. Um, he, he was incredible, um, some of the things he was doing that World Cup, so it would be out of them three with pro probably John Terry just edging it. Thank you. Well, I'm sorry, I've just received loads of supporters' questions through on Twitter. We'll go to Chris Miller. He also sent this in through email. Chris, I was going to ask it, but you've tweeted it as well, so I'll definitely make sure I ask it. What fixture are you most looking forward to this season and why? Blackburn on Saturday. I'm just saying that because you can yeah. just write No, listen, no, I, obviously, um, I always look out for Brighton. Um, it's special going back to my hometown and playing in that stadium and, and stuff like that. Um, Fulham's going to be another one. I haven't played there yet. That that would be great. But I just think with the start we've made, you know, it's, it's such an exciting start that every every game coming up is is so important, and we just want to keep staying in in the mix. You know, just keep keep as high up in that table as possible. And obviously, Blackburn's the next fixture, so you've got to be looking forward to these challenges and and, and trying to win as many games as possible. So I'm, I'm going to be a bit cheesy and say Blackburn. Liar. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll also go to Matt Mullins. He's also sent us a question on Twitter. Thank you, Matt. If you were injured, who would you like to see take? Yeah, we'll touch some wood. Touch We've got wood table in front of us. We'll touch that. If you're injured, who would you like to see take over as captain? We've seen Frano often captains. Cookie has had the armband a few times. I know you don't want to give that to anyone else, but who do you think? Who big voice in that dressing room? No, I think there? I think Frano's more than worthy of captain in this side. Um, He's got a lot of experience. Uh, he's, he's a popular guy in the dressing room. The lads respect him, and his views on the football are, are, are common with the gaffers. Um, you can rely on him. He's dependable. Cookie as well, the same. Um, Campy, another one. He's got experience of being a captain. There's so many. Hearty. There's too many to, for me to to really give my opinion on. But whoever it is, you know, they're, they're worthy of it. Um, the gaffer, you know, he wouldn't give it to anyone for the sake of it, and. Cookie and Frano should take great pride in, in a captain in this club. How big is it that Frano has signed that new contract and always yeah, friend huge, of yours? Yeah, yeah, it's huge. Um, listen, Smithy, he's, he's had a good pre-season. I think he deserves a mention for the way he played the other night. Um, but Frano, what he's done for the last two years, you know, the consecutive games he's put in, the assists he's got us, the clean sheets he's helped us with, it's, it's huge lift for, for the club because, uh, let's be honest, I think, he, he, you know, Derby's a good proposition. Um, Obviously, it's close to his home, but it just shows the power that we've got now and that we're not prepared to lose our players and that we are going forward and we are still progressive. So it's, it's a huge lift not only for Frano but, and the fans, but also the lads in the dressing room and the gaffer. All good signs. I'm sure Bournemouth fans enjoy that. In case you're just tuning in, this is a Google Plus Hangout, the first one we've ever done. We are live with Tommy Elphick here um, and we've got four supporters across the bottom. I'm... Well, we are going over time here, so we'll race back to our live sports questions. Peter, far away with your second question. Uh, yeah, actually, to follow on from the, the last question regarding the sort of the, the banter you have in the dressing room, essentially, David James, a couple of seasons ago when he was with us, he said that the team spirit at AFC Bournemouth was the best he'd ever seen uh, coming from a, a player of his status and playing with in the sort of teams that he's played in. That was an incredible statement. So I'm really just wondering where, how you create that team spirit at Bournemouth and how do you go about keeping it, for example, when new players come in? Yeah, um, I just, listen, that, that's not by luck, you know, that, that's the recruitment team, they think about that a lot when they bring players in, you know, you don't just look at as a, a footballer as, as someone, you know, who's playing the game, you have to look at their lifestyle, so much goes into recruiting players and I think that's a big thing for us and, and everybody that the gaffer's brought in since he's been here has added 
to that team spirit. They've brought something to the dressing room. They're a strong character. They've got a winning mentality. Um, so the people who have put this squad together from, from day one ever since probably before I was here, you've, you've got to give them a lot of credit. But then obviously you have tough times and uh, when you're not winning as many games as, you, as you'd like to have done, um, for example, at the start of last season, it, it takes the manager to keep that together and help keep morale up. Um, and and, and he's, he's first class at doing that, you know, giving us a lift when we need one, clipping our wings when we need it, you know. So um, he, he a lot of it that he creates, um, but as, as I say, our, our group is very unique. And what JMO is saying is, is not a lie, it is true, you know. It's, it's a great place to come in and work every day. And we're all of a similar age, we're all going in similar directions in our career. And it's just, it is a great mix and, and, and a great blend of, of characters. And how, how does that play out? Because, I mean, in a sense, you know, when you've got you know, players in every position, as we pretty much have mm. now, backing out and then not playing the team that might not even be in the squad, you know, I guess there's a, there's a good rivalry, but that can also create a sense of why I in the team are better than him or whatever. Yeah, totally. Um, but again, that's, that's down to the gaffer and his man management. Um, again, one of the gaffer's best traits is he's honest. Um, he'll tell you why you're out the team, why you're in the team. You know, he'll... he'll show you clips and as I say when I say there's there's no stone on term with him he, he, he's got everything uh, he looks at everything whether it's uh, training playing so I think if everyone's honest here you know they'll know why they're in the team they'll know why they're not in the team um, and, it, and and also when when there's players out of the team maybe it's upon characters like myself or, or Ian Hart and, and Lee Camp Frano um, to keep the other boys spirits up because that's hard when you when you're not in the team. You know, I found that very hard last year when you're not in the team and you have to buy into it because this this club's going forward. And if you don't buy into it, that's one of our biggest traits is our togetherness and, and the character of the squad. If you don't buy into it, you know, the the manager won't let that happen and, and he won't have you around the place. So um, if you want to be a part of it, you you got to buy into it. That's brilliant. I'll make it continue. Thanks, Tommy. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you, Peter. Um, we, I believe we've lost Adrian on the end. He's frozen, as you can mm. probably tell, Tom. Um, so we're going we're gonna to go straight to George um, with another question for Tommy. Okay. Ooh. Sorry, I lost my headphone there. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I was wondering, uh, going back to you being captain, do you, find, do, you find, do you feel under pressure? Do you, do you find yourself having to think about, oh, I'm captain, I need to command people about, or does it just, just come naturally? The only thing I feel pressure of from is Kelly trying to get my <laughs> notes every week. Um, I need no, to, listen, it's, it's gone through. I was going to say, uh, yeah, need a reminder them, uh, on yeah. YouTube Live, we need to buy tonight and he's <laughs> still not done them. <laughs> like, Tommy is very good, I want to point out, actually, Tommy, not many people at clubs write their whole notes, but Tommy is fantastic and does write them. I only have to change a few grammar, only like an exclamation mark <laughs> there. But he does write them himself, but he's going to have straight after this, he's not leaving here until he's written them. But anyway, sorry, carry on. Yeah, no, um, do I, I, don't, I don't really feel I had pressure, no, because I think a big part of being a centre-half is, is talking on the pitch, and, and that's, that is natural to me. That's the way I grew up playing, and I need to do that to be at my best. I need to sort of get people around me and you know, I can't be as good as I can be if Cookie's not quite on his game or if Frano or Smithy aren't on their game. So I need them and, and they need me and that's that sort of morale and togetherness that you need to, to be successful. But um, I've always prided myself on living my life right, you know, trying to be an example. You know, I was very fortunate that my dad played the game and, and my brother was at Brighton before me. So I sort of followed in their footsteps and I knew what it took to, to be a professional footballer, if you, if you like, and that was a big head start for me. And there's a lot of sacrifices, and, and you're living your life 24-7 around football, and, and that's the only way it can be done the, this day and age. So um, I was very fortunate in, in that sense, but uh, I've just sort of had to take that on to, to try and be at a new level in, in terms of when you see youngsters like Bailey come through, try and give them an example to, to hit to, if you like, and, and try and reach. and you know, as I say, that, that professionalism and, and being an example for, for the for the youngsters, you can never lose that. Cheers. Thank you. Right, we'll move on to Gareth. I'm aware, well, I was hoping to keep this half an hour, but Tommy's talked too much, which I don't think anyone's complaining about, so we'll keep going. Um, Gareth, fire away with your next question. Um, yeah, Tommy, one that I'm not alone in asking or, or wanting to know the answer to this one. 
can you explain a little bit more about your pre-match ritual, I guess we could call it? <laughs> you you don't take part in the team photo, you go and sort of, almost like you're saying a prayer and say a few words to yourself and not near the, the post at, uh, at the North Stand end? Um, yeah, um, I'm a Virgo, so I believe from my, from my girlfriend that um, I'm a man of ritual and it's sort of, I don't know, something I've developed. Um, uh, I have things that I do before the game in the dressing room. You know, I have to be in a certain state of mind to be at my best. Um, and from a young age, I think the first ever game I played, I remember the goalkeeper needed his, he had the wrong jersey on and needed to change it. So there was like a real long delay before the kickoff, and they was trying to rustle up a, a new jersey for him. And, and anyway, they got a jersey. And I remember taking myself off to the post and banging my boots off on the post. And we won the game, so I thought, right, that's it. I've got to bang my boots <laughs> off the game before we get before we play. So. Um, and then, like developing it, I, I sort of met up with a psychologist later on, a couple of years later, and he sort of said, "What's all this business about you banging your boots off on the post?" And I said, "Well, I'm a bit superstitious. I, I do certain things before the game, and that's one of the things." And he just gave me a little technique to try and focus, um, to try and regain some composure before the game kicks off, and see what I'm going to do for the team. So it's, it's a, it's, I wouldn't say a meditation, but it's a moment of me preparing for the game and. Also, I like connecting with the fans, you know, and I get a buzz off when you run to that post and the fans are cheering your name. That's that's a great feeling for me. And you know, it's, it, at the end of the day, we need the fans to be successful. We we need you behind us, and we need everyone driving in the right direction. Um, and that rapport with the fans is it, it, it's great because they spur me on and it, it helps me to spur the team on and it gets the atmosphere going. And um, but stripping it down is, is superstition, and it's a, it's a time for me to to get where I need to be really. Cool. Thank you. Gareth, you can ask, I know you're going to kill me if you don't get to ask your shirt questions, so we are over half an hour, but go on, ask Tommy about your shirts. <laughs> yeah, obviously, as I said earlier, I write the shirt tails piece in the program. I think I've been called an expert. That's not my words, that's Kelly and Max's words. <laughs> I have, I've got hundreds in, in a collection. My wife keeps telling me I have to put them in the loft, but uh, I can't do it. But yeah, so out of the three shirts we've got this season, which I'll just say, I think they're probably the best trio of shirts we've ever had. What's your favourite? Um, I like the blue one. I think it's a little bit different. Uh, it looked good in the pictures. I think everything's come out. We haven't actually worn it yet, but as you say, the, the free shirts this year are, are really good. I'm not sure the kit man agrees with the away kit. Trying to keep that white is going to be a bit of a nightmare, but um, I, like, I like the third one, so hopefully we get to wear that soon. Okay. My, like my, my favourite still. My favourite's the white one. Yeah. It was white, good in the summer. White just, white just equals class and quality with a shirt, so simplicity. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, the, the blue one's something we've never had before, so uh, yeah, no, cool, thank you. Top man. Brilliant, that's great. I'll do a shameless plug. If you want to read more from him or from Gareth, you can pick up the programme because he writes in there every week, as he said. Um, anyway, I think that's all we've got time for from um, our supporters along the bottom, but I think they'll stay with us till the end. Just want to ask you a few more questions that we've had through on Twitter, Tommy. Um, you're going to really like this one because I know earlier you watched, earlier I don't know if you saw, but we did the Ice Bucket Challenge. Um, it was a cause close to Lee Camp's heart and he was on the Instagast it and he then nominated Ian Hart. So we did the Ice Bucket Challenge and I know Tommy's watching. Matt Hall would like you to do it. Is that an official nomination? <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be an official nomination. Has he not got to get that Matt Hall, if you can tweet in again before the end yeah, of this, I want to see him we'll get, get an ice, do it. I want to see him get the Ice Bucket first. <laughs> uh, but maybe. no, look, the lads are doing it but they're not donating so... Yeah, they got a donation. Campy was not the only one that was suggested. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I think a few of the lads have done it. So um, maybe if an official nomination comes in in time, yeah. Tommy might do it. Um, and then we, there's a few more. There's a few more light-hearted ones. Alan Gard emailed this morning and said, "Are you a cake or a biscuit man, Tommy?" Biscuit. Dan Hodges ain't gonna be happy with that. Uh, custard cream. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Helen and Danny came to us on Twitter this morning. Could you explain the uniqueness of each of the new signings? We've got three new signings. What? If you um, can wrap it up. Yeah, no, I think all three all three players bring something different to the team, something that we haven't had. Um, obviously, Gozo and um, uh, Junior bring Premier League experience. Um, three fantastic lads have, have fitted straight into the team, into the dressing room, which is important. They seem settled with their life, so that's that's great. But 
uh, Callum brings a, a raw power to the to the front line. I think everybody's seen that. Um, he's got tons of ability and, and potential. Um, Junior brings a lot of trickery and uh, to come on and score for him at home the other day was 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 great for him. Um, and and Gozo, who we haven't seen as much of yet, he, he's 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 got that class, you know, that Premier League class, and he'll bring a bit of meat to the midfield as well. You know, he's he's real strong and, and sturdy and. Uh, he's very, very good on the ball, so uh, hopefully we're going to see the best of all three. Very good answer. As I mentioned at the beginning, we did have some people that unfortunately couldn't join us. Um, I was personally gutted, and I know they really were. And um, We were due to have some people, firstly from Thailand, he couldn't get here in time, and then in Australia, unfortunately their internet connection wasn't good enough. Um, but I did promise them that I would try and answer, it, ask a few of their questions for Tommy. They asked me for an Australian accent, but having discussed this before with Tommy, we decided it was probably best that I just stick to my normal voice. Um, so I'll fire through a few. Apologies, guys, if you're watching. I can't do them all because we are massively over time here now. Uh, firstly, Nick, who is the dressing room motivator? So I think that's potentially you, but you're not going to say that. Um, he says, by that I mean who usually starts off the songs on the coach? I don't know if you sing songs on the coach. You've already told us who the practical joker is, but maybe the bigger personalities. Um, Frano's, Frano's in charge of the music on a match day. Um, he gets that on point, usually. Um, I have quite a bit to say before the game. That's just me, myself, getting to where I need to be in a psychological state. Um, there's big characters, you know, Jan, he's, he's a big character. Cookie, Frano, uh, Campy as well. Uh, he's a good calming influence. And, and Hearty, I think it's, it's such a great blend. It's a unique experience before the game. Um, great for everyone to see what actually goes on in the dressing room because it's, it's a little bit crazy and it's pumped up and it's, it's a great time for me. Um, and, and the gaffer, obviously, that's, that's one of his traits as well. He, he's a good motivator and gets us where we need to be. JT um, and Tinner's the first team coaches do a great job as well. I was going to say, obviously, everyone wants to know what goes on inside the dressing room. I know Eddie's Eddie's kind of motto is not to tell people too much. Is there a kind of a procedure that happens before a game? Do you all speak in an order or is it kind of you all just chip in? No, I think, like, listen, the, the where, where we get our information over is Monday to Friday or, or, mm. or on a Monday before a Tuesday game, you know. Um, Gaffer is always preparing us for the next game. Um, he will always take time to talk to you about individuals or talk to you, talk to you about the way we're going to play, certain things we're going to do. So all the tactical stuff is really done on a Monday to Friday. And he will give us little refreshes and, and stuff like that. Um, but then obviously, yeah, we do get together and the Gaffer will give us a, a bit of a G up before the game. And um, as well, the analysis, they, they don't get enough credit of, of what they do. You know, they, they, they really do work beyond, above and beyond what, what, what's required, you know, so there's plenty in there. Ian has asked, this is an interesting one, what does the AFC Bournemouth fitness routine look like? How is it broken down? Is there like a set amount of time you focus on free weights, cardio, etc.? I think... Yeah, no, it's, we're very, again, that department, we're, we're very clued up. We, we've got great fitness guys, um, Dan Hodges and, and Ben, um, again, work tireless uh, for us. Um, obviously, at the moment with with Saturday Tuesday fixtures, a lot of it is just based on recovery, um, trying to get ready for the for the next game, uh, the ice baths, uh, the recovery shakes, the food that we eat, you know. Um, but with with a Saturday Saturday game, we, we will try to get a weight session in twice a week. Usually, after a Saturday, we will have a Sunday Monday off to recover. Uh, two hard sessions on a on a Tuesday and a Wednesday, and then really taper it down for the, for the game on Thursday and Friday. So. And there's a lot of pre prehab that goes into the the training sessions, uh, a lot of preventative stuff as well. So it's it's pretty complex. Brilliant. Uh, Craig in Australia has some questions. I believe they've already been answered. I just want to say, you know, Craig, we haven't forgotten about you. Um, and Chris has asked about squad rotation. He said, what effect will it have, especially after the good start to the season? I think he means in a positive way. Yeah. What? How important is it to have that big squad? Well, I, I just think from from the sort of the exit a game you can learn so much you know change the 11 keep a clean sheet and, and get through in the competition win another game that is so positive um, not only from you know the players that we've got but the attitude that they've shown and um, everything we've done uh, to, to get through um, and then obviously on from there the, the Brentford game the two subs come on and, and change the game for us um, this competition's fantastic as long as it's channeled in the right way um, driving each other forward, I think that brings the best out of everyone and, and we will need everyone this season, you know, every member of the squad will play a huge part this season um, and when you see the people that, that we've got on the bench, it's, it's just such a boost to the lads playing and 
when, when you're rotating it and bringing players in, you know, you're going to need that to be successful. Another very good answer. I think that is us done here. I think we've had uh, an abundance of questions from the guys that joined us live and on Twitter, so thank you very much for joining us. Um, Tommy, good luck this weekend. Are you travelling up tomorrow, I believe? Tomorrow, yeah. Early start. Looking forward to it? Yeah, it'd be good. Another win, hopefully. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we wish Tommy and all the team lots of luck. Um, also, thank you to our participants, um, Peter, George, Gareth, and Adrian, who I believe we've lost, and we can just see a little silhouette of his face. But thank you all very much, and for everyone that interacted on Twitter, Tommy has signed these. Can you show them? Um, and I'll pop them all in the post to you as a thank you for joining us. Um, it's been great to have you here, um, and hopefully we'll be doing another Hangout very soon. So thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.